In this video, we focus on metabolomics. And in particular, in this video, we are going to go through an overview of metabolomics, incorporating some of the key terminology that you need to be familiar with, as well as a walk through the history of metabolomics, starting with the simplest types of metabolomic experiments, and then moving forward to what the common workflow is today for conducting metabolomic analyses. So to get started, just as a reminder of our earlier video where we overviewed omics technologies in general, when we refer to metabolomics, what we're referring to is the study of changes in the metabolome of an organism, where the metabolome is the complete set of metabolites that are found within a cell or within a particular organism, such as a human. The metabolome, unlike the genome, the set of genes in an organism, the metabolome is dynamic, meaning it is constantly changing. And that's due to the fact that metabolites that are present within a cell are the endpoints of a plethora of different cellular processes. So metabolomes will vary wildly over the life cycle of an organism or even over the course of a few minutes. For example, if you eat a meal, suddenly your body will respond to that at the molecular level by altering the levels of a variety of different metabolites. So to put a little bit, bit of this in words, to summarize what I was just mentioning, when we use the term metabolome, which is a key term here that you should be familiar with, what we're referring to is not just one or a handful of metabolites that are produced by an organism, but the metabolome is going to be that complete set of so-called small molecules within whatever your study system is. So within a particular cell, if you're talking about bacteria or fungi, often we look at the level of the cell or within a particular organ or up to the level of looking at an entire organism or even an entire population of organisms, such as if you're working with bacteria, you couldn't look um, oftentimes just at a single organism, but instead of the bacteria is growing in cultures, there's millions and millions of bacteria there, and you'll be looking at the metabolite set as a whole summed over all those organisms. So it's the complete set of small molecules within a cell or within an organism. And so this brings us to a point here. When we refer to a small molecule, what are we referring to when we say a molecule is small? What's typically the size of that? When we are evaluating the metabolome of an organism, generally the focus is on compounds that have a molecular weight of approximately 1.5 kilodaltons or less. So we're looking at approximately 1.5 kilodaltons or less. And as a reminder, when we say kilodalton, a kilodalton is a thousand daltons. And so what we're thinking of in terms of molecular weight there is the molecular weight range is going to be 1500 grams per mole or less. And that's a rough approximation because some of the analytical tools we will use in metabolomics such as NMR and mass spectrometry, can evaluate molecules that have a larger molecular weight. But in general, the sample processing techniques that are used for metabolomics analyses focus primarily on generating mixtures of compounds from organisms that's where those mixtures of compounds have molecular weights of less than 1.5 kilodaltons or so. So they fit in that category of small molecules. So when we're looking at a metabolome, we are not generally looking at the larger classes of bio macromolecules, such as metabolomics will generally not be looking at proteins. Proteins, even though they are certainly a um, uh, compound within a cell, those are our biological macromolecules and they would fall under the umbrella of proteomics. Likewise, large carbohydrate molecules will often have molecular weights that are above this 1.5 kilodalton threshold. And so those would generally also be ignored in this field of metabolomics. So in general, what we are trying to accomplish by evaluating the metabolomes of organisms and particularly comparing them between different organisms is we're looking for the chemical fingerprints that result from cellular processes. So metabolomics, to put this in writing here, is going to be looking at establishing the particular chemical fingerprints, much like your fingerprint identifies you specifically, the fingerprint of chemistry will identify the particular 
physiological state of a cell based on the chemistry that that cell or that organism is producing. So metabolomics establishes the chemical fingerprint, in other words, chemical identification features of particular cellular processes. A cellular process or cellular processes could be related to a diseased state of an organism that results in a predictable chemical fingerprint. Or another example would be that in metabolomics, we could look at the impacts of environmental changes on the chemistry of organisms. For example, we could ask the question, if we increase the temperature of seawater, what would be the impact on the chemistry of marine life, such as how would that change in ocean temperature affect the metabolome of marine plants or fish or other organisms to understand the relationship between the environment that an organism is living in and its metabolome, its small molecule chemical composition, because that small molecule chemical composition ultimately results from the particular chemical the particular cellular processes that are going on in a cell. And so by understanding the changes in the metabolites in the cell, we can understand better at the cellular level and molecular level, what is um, exactly going on in an organism in response to stress or in response to some other change. So continuing our tour of key terms associated with metabolomics, we can talk about two types of metabolomes, the exometabolome and the endometabolome. The term exo refers to outside and hence the exometabolome refers to metabolomics of compounds that are excreted from the cell. So the exometabolome would refer to compounds that are excreted from the cell. On the other hand, the endometabolome would refer to compounds that are found within the cell. So one example of evaluating the exometabolome of a cell would be if we evaluated the cellular waste products that are excreted from a cell and monitored how those change in response to particular stress, that would be an example of measuring and monitoring the exometabolome or using exometabolomics. On the other hand, if we're looking at what are the internal changes in metabolites in response to a stress, that would be an example of evaluating the endometabolome through metabolomics analyses. The main difference between looking at the endometabolome versus the exometabolome will have to deal with how we generate the mixture of compounds that we are evaluating by metabolomics. The overall tools of mass spectrometry and NMR and data analysis techniques are similar regardless of whether we're evaluating the compounds that are outside of the cell, the exometabolome, or the compounds that are within the cell, the endometabolome. So the main difference will be the specific techniques that we would use to extract the compounds that are being excreted from the cell versus the compounds that are trapped within the cell. And we will get into that sample preparation techniques of endometabolome compounds versus exometabolome compounds a little bit later here. Metabolomics has been applied to a huge number of different types of systems, ranging from simple forms of life, such as bacteria, to much more complex multicellular organisms, such as plants and even humans. In fact, when we look at humans, it was about 13 years ago in 2007 that the first draft of the human metabolome was generated primarily through LCMS and GCMS, gas chromatography mass spectrometry. And at the moment, the human metabolome database has about 40,000 different compounds within it. And the reason why I have this rather cryptic human shape here is this is an image that is sometimes used to represent schematically the human metabolome because you can see within it these various diagrams and representations of different compounds representing and symbolizing the human metabolome. The human metabolome database with its 40,000 plus different entries contains both metabolites that are natively found within humans as well as drug metabolites, meaning the compounds that when a human takes a common drug, 
such as perhaps Advil or some other very commonly administered drug, what are the breakdown metabolites of that compound that can be traced and found within the human body? So that brings us to another key set of terminology here. In the metabolomics, particularly when we talk about human-based metabolomics, metabolites can be described as being either endogenous, meaning that they are produced by the host organism through chemical reactions that are carried out by enzymes within the host, or those metabolites can be exogenous, meaning that those compounds originated from an environmental origin, such as if you were to consume uh, meat that have been cooked on the grill, the grilled meat, the charring on that meat has a variety of organic compounds that very likely would be detected for several hours or several days if a metabolomics analysis were conducted of a person's digestive tract or bloodstream after consuming that meat. So an endogenous compound is going to be referring to a compound that is produced by the organism itself. Exogenous is referring to compounds that are introduced into the organism or the metabolites that result from the breakdown of those exogenous compounds. And this terminology is most often used and applied toward human metabolomics. So exogenous, exo again meaning outside. So exogenous compounds are compounds that come from an external horse, an external source. So exogenous is referring here specifically to metabolites originating from outside the organism. So that could be compounds that we consume dietarily. It could be metabolites that are drug molecules that we have ingested. It could be compounds that we are present in the air that we breathe that are then detected in our metabolome, the complete set of molecules. So these are compounds that are not, not genetically encoded by our genome, meaning that if a compound is exogenous, it's coming incomplete from the outside. On the other hand, if it's endogenous, it has a genetic origin, meaning that since we realize that genes get transcribed and translated into proteins, those proteins act as enzymes to catalyze chemical reactions. Endogenous compounds are hence genetically encoded because if we look back at how that molecule is formed, we can trace it back to a gene that encodes the protein that acts as an enzyme to catalyze that reaction. So endogenous metabolites are those that are genetically encoded or the breakdown product of those compounds. So these are genetically encoded compounds produced by the organism that's being evaluated. Metabolomics is an old field of study with a very rich history that started back in the 1940s or even earlier, where people had an interest in correlating the chemistry of an organism with disease states and other stressors. The field, though, has rapidly evolved in the last 20 years or so, particularly as it relates to the development of high-tech mass spectrometry and NMR tools. And so this is why we're covering metabolomics immediately after our unit on bioanalytical chemistry is because bioanalytical chemistry has revolutionized the field of metabolomics. So let's take a step back in the history of metabolomics and look at the old school ways of going about evaluating the metabolomes of organisms. So taking this step back in time to see how far science has come with the field of metabolomics. In the 1940s, paper chromatography was the state-of-the-art method for correlating metabolite patterns from urine, saliva, and other bodily fluids with diseases. And one example of that was that the metabolite patterns from urine differed between patients with schizophrenia and those without schizophrenia. And so paper chromatography is really the state-of-the-art analytical technique back then for conducting metabolomics analysis. So we would call this paper chromatography 
metabolomics. And I'm going to put metabolomics in quotes because it was a very basic, rudimentary, low-tech approach that certainly came nowhere close to detecting all of the metabolites from a particular cell or bodily fluid. Um, but an example of this use of paper chromatography and metabolomics was tracing or identifying, diagnosing schizophrenia. Where researchers found that what they could do is take a urine sample, extract the chemical compounds from that urine sample, and use paper chromatography, which if you think back to some of your early day biology or chemistry classes, paper chromatography was the technique where you could take a sheet of specialized chromatographic paper, you spot down here toward the bottom of the sheet of chromatography paper, your compound mixtures. So in the case of determining the unique metabolic signature for patients with schizophrenia versus individuals without, the mixture of compounds would be spotted down here at the bottom. And I'm going to label that one of these is the treatment, which I'll put T, which that would be the person with schizophrenia. And the control group would be individuals without schizophrenia, donated some urine samples, and then using a solvent, which would be applied to this piece of chromatography paper, the solvent, the mobile phase, which is the solvent, we call it the mobile phase because it's moving up the stationary field, the solid substrate on which the compounds are sitting, that solvent would cause the compounds to migrate at different rates up the piece of paper. And so what we would see then is a distinct set of spots corresponding to different compounds that are present in the treatment, the person with schizophrenia, compared to the control, the person without. And you can see that based on the red dots I've shown so far, there's really not differences between the two samples because there are going to inevitably be a ton of compounds that are identical between the two. And then you would look for particular compounds that allowed you to differentiate between the treatment and the control organs. So for example, this dot I've shown in green here schematically would be a unique biomarker, a unique compound to the patient with schizophrenia. And so that particular metabolite could be linked to diagnosing schizophrenia. And this was a very low tech way of doing this because for one, based on looking at the spot of a compound on a paper chromatography plate, you have no idea what the identity of that compound is. So that's very much in contrast to the more modern techniques of mass spectrometry and NMR, where we can identify, or at least gain some understanding of the molecular features of the compound that distinguishes the treatment and control organisms. Additionally, this paper chromatography technique was largely qualitative rather than quantitative. Qualitative meaning that you could get a yes, no answer about is a compound present or not, but you couldn't get rigorous quantitation of how much compound is present in one individual versus another or one population versus another, meaning a population of patients with a particular disease versus a population of people without that particular disease. So we've come a long way in the time since then. And what we are going to look at in the next video is where we've come with that and what the typical workflow is for the um, metabolomics.